We're going to be reading this morning from the book of Corinthians, if you want to turn with me. Uh, 1 Corinthians um, chapter 16 this morning, uh, the book of Corinthians, if you want to turn um, with me. Our title this morning is Doorways Placed by God, and the question comes, will you enter? We, if you look at your life, you will see that every day there will be opportunities for you to do something. Sometimes that'll be for the bad, sometimes that'll be for the good. It's understanding that when we come to faith, the Lord will put before you and you alone opportunities to witness and to reach people. Amen? Don't be afraid to say amen with me this morning, church. It helps me greatly. So the church, listen, God places before you, for you personally, opportunities. Amen. Do you see that in your life? People that only you can pray for. People that only you can speak to. People that only trust you and know you. That's the opportunities. And if you've ever missed these opportunities, don't worry. God is the God of second and third chances. He doesn't stroke us off. There's many, many doors that follow. So that's our theme this morning. There's doors in the faith that we need to be first aware of and we need to enter. And there's some doors that we must enter to go deeper in the things of God. But let us read this morning first and foremost. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through to 9. Apostle Paul speaking, he goes, After I go through Macedonia, however, I will come to you. For I'll be going through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. Verse 7, For I do not want to see you now only in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits me. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door, notice, a great door for the effective work of the ministry is open to me, even though many there oppose me. So, Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Lord, we thank you, God, that what we see within these pages, Lord, is applicable to us. Lord, has you opened and closed doors for the Apostle Paul? Lord, you open and you close doors for your children, your church. And, Lord, the Apostle, Lord, understood what it was to try to go places, but the Spirit withheld him and sent him in other directions. And so it is with us, God. Help us to understand that closed doors are also from you. But most importantly, God, when we know there's an open door, when we know there's an opportunity, a place where you are sending us, Lord, a person to witness to, God, would you give us the boldness and the courage that we need and the strength? Even the faith, Father, enters through it and trust you in it. Lord, bless us this morning. Lord, in all our walks, and all our situations this morning, Lord, will you touch each of our lives this morning in Jesus' name. Lord, would you fill up and touch our well within us that it may begin to overflow afresh today, God. We ask for the fresh wind today, the fresh touch of God, the fresh anointing upon each of our lives, God. And with that anointing, the burdens of this world simply fall to the ground. Hallelujah. Lord, may we leave here in the joy and in the strength of the Lord, and not bound by anything that this world has placed before us, may we know a touch today like never before, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. George Whitfield said this, if you're, going to walk, if you're going to walk with Jesus Christ, you're going to be opposed. And in our days, to be a true Christian is really to become a scandal. In other words, following the Lord Jesus Christ today will upset many and bring much, much opposition into your ministry. That would be today's context. And in our text, what we see here is the Apostle Paul, he's making plans to go on a missionary journey. He's going to preach the gospel. He knows the call of God upon his life. And we read that he's, he's planning to stop in Macedonia. But I want you to notice what he says to the Macedonian church, because we can miss this. Now, notice his words. Perhaps I will stay with you a while, or even spend the winter. You wouldn't want him calling past for a cup of tea. He could be there all winter. But then he says this, so that, you, so that you can help me on my journey. Now notice, wherever I go. This man didn't have it all worked out, and neither do you and I. He didn't know exactly who or where he was going to be going to minister next. But what Paul understood was this, that as he moved through his life, that God would place before him many doors of opportunity to minister. And that's true for you and I as well. Think about it now. There's places where you'll be tomorrow where I'll not. And there's opportunities that'll come that you're aware that I'll never get and you'll never get for me. 
These are doors that God places before us, opportunities. And, and we see this in the Apostle Paul's life very, very clearly. At different times in your life, whether it be at school or college, in your town, in your workplace, perhaps even just walking about the, the town, the Lord places before each of us doors of opportunities to reach people, to minister to people. Can I encourage you, church, to keep your spiritual eye open and look for what the Lord, and, and, and wait for that prompting. Because when the Lord prompts you to go and do something, you'll find the doors will open very quickly for you. It may well be a, an opportunity to help with a need, to, to pray with a broken soul, to invite someone to church, to even lead them to Christ. These are the opportunities that, that God has given to each of us as a church. Be aware, church, that's what I'm saying, and be aware of these doors of opportunities that God has placed in your life, in your life, the doors of opportunities, and you will know them, because the chances are we wrestle to go through most of these doors. But Paul, he looked for these openings. I want you to notice something. As Paul was about to leave Ephesus, he sees before him what is appeared to be as him, he describes it as an open door to minister to somebody. And so he changes his plans. See, when God asks us or prompts us to go somewhere, we might well have plans for the day. But then God like that will put somebody in our hearts. You see, it will not always suit our, our own personal plans. And he says, I will stay in Ephesus because a great door for effective work has opened to me. And then he says these words, but many oppose me. Aren't they lovely words, church? But many oppose me. See, Paul lived for God. And there were people that came into his life that sought to destroy his testimony. You understand that this morning. There's people that come into our lives and they're not there for good. They want to destroy our testimony. Now, they don't come across like that. They come across as our friends. They come across as people that we even perhaps even like. But what we notice is that there's something about these people that every time we take a step with them, we're taking a step away from the Lord they subtly begin to turn us from the Lord. Now, be careful of this in your life. Now, I'm going to make a statement here in a minute, and you might think this man's very radical, but uh, listen to what I'm saying, and I'll bring a scripture to back it up. If you have people in your life that are subtly, now, subtly stopping you from going on with the Lord and causing you to go a different direction, the Bible likens these people as children of Satan. Now, that's a very strong statement. What I, when I think of this, what, I, what comes to my mind is this. There are people who act like angels, but they're actually devils. They will oppose you as a Christian and try to turn you away from the Lord. Well, you better uh, back that up, pastor. So 1 John 3, verse 10. Let me read this to you. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice the righteousness of God is not of him. You see, there, there is these people that are not necessarily actual children of Satan as such, but they're used as his children and used to do his work, and they oppose and they hinder our lives. Now, if somebody has a row with you, let's not call them children of God. Sometimes we need corrected, and sometimes there's things in our life that we need challenged on, but we know what we're talking about here. People that are drawing you away, they're doing you bad harm. You're not walking with God because of them. In Matthew 13, 38, we read that the good seed are the sons of the kingdom, the sons of God. Then it mentions the terrors. And these terrors are people who befriend you and lead you from Christ. And they're referred to, these terrors are referred to as the sons of the devil. So I'm going to move on with that. But what the, what the point is this, be careful of the people in your life that aren't encouraging you on in the things of God. Amen? And Paul says this, a great door for the effective ministry is open to me but many oppose me. Now, let's look at some of these doors that God has set before us. There's a quote that I came across, and I couldn't find a name to put to it, so I'll just, it's a quote. And it says this, if you want God to close and open doors in your life, you need to let go of the doorknob. And I have come to realize in my own life that old ways, old methods will not open new doors to see people saved. We need to stop and I need to stop holding on to old doorknobs and look for them new doors of opportunity to reach people in our lives. Amen, church? Don't, 
Don't just rely on what used to be. Ask the Lord to show you what's new. What is he doing next? What other opportunities has he set before you? Let us not rely on what our grandfathers did because they must have had the, the, the discernment to look for the openings. We must look for the openings, not rely on old door, doorknobs. Look for the new ones to open. To reach people, we must be set apart. And I want to bring that out. And that leads us to our first door. Now, I brought a thought like this to the elders at the start of the year and the session at the start of the year. And what I've done with this, I've taken the few thoughts and I've expanded it. And it was doors of opportunity. As the leadership of this church, we've got a choice. We can either sit still and just play church, or we can really go after the things of God and take chances. And as God gives us opportunity. So we've taken this this morning, I've taken this this morning, and I'm broadening it out a wee bit for us as a church. So the first door is the door of surrender. Now, Jesus himself had to walk through this door in his personal ministry. Listen to what Jesus, when he's speaking to his father, he says, not my will, but yours. See, surrender, church, is a battle of wills. Not my will, but your will, Lord. Isn't it challenging sometimes? Not my will, Lord, but yours. And very naturally we go, oh, but Lord, it's my will first, but not yours. And here's the, the, the door of surrender. But if we want to do anything for God, that's the first door that we must go through. We must surrender to the will of God. And the church must enter through this door of surrender and walk in the will of God. We must die, as the Bible puts it, on the altar of self. To live for God is likened to a sacrifice. And that means there will be things that we will have to say no to to honor the Lord. I suspect as missionaries, there's, there's things you've had to say no to in your life. Some people think that missionaries and, and pastors and these sort of people, they've no aspirations of their own. We have to fight and missionaries have to fight that not to go after the house and the car and all these things because they're naturally things that we want to chase after. But there's this altar depending on our calling, but all of our calling is to make sure that we're dying to self and we're hearing the call and we're doing and we're saying no to things that aren't good for us. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 12 now. Remember, we're talking about surrender. I appeal to you, brethren, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Now hear this now, hear this church. In Christ, please hear this now. Because we need to know this about ourselves because we don't feel like this. But in, our, in Christ, our bodies have become a living, holy instrument for the Lord and for the work of the ministry. I can't comprehend that. You know the tabernacle, the tent in the wilderness? Listen, in the worship of the tabernacle, what we read is that tools and utensils used to both build the tent and be used within the tent, they had to be sanctified. You know what that really is? To be declared by God to be holy. That's it. What God says, you're holy, you're holy. doesn't matter what your man up the road says. What God says matters. And when God declared these instruments and utensils holy, they were able to be used in the sacrificial service in the tabernacle ministry. What a picture of the church. Each person sanctified by God declared holy and set apart for sacrificial service in the ministry of soul winning. It's not wonderful, church. You're declared holy. I appeal to you, brethren, as people declared holy in Christ, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. Or another way we could put this, this is, I appeal to you, brethren, enter through the door of surrender and allow the Lord to use you as an instrument of righteousness. So here's the thing. The Lord can't work through an unsurrendered life, can He? If we don't adhere or listen to the, to the instruction of the, of the Word of the Lord, He can't use us. And the late Leonard Ravenhill, he asked a question to his church regarding Christian living, and he said this, are the things that you're living for worth Christ dying for? You see, when we fully surrender our lives unto the Lord, what I see is that we are primed to be used of God. So there's the door of surrender. The next door is the door of service. A surrendered life is ready for service. Now, not a perfect life because there's not really any of us exist, but a life nonetheless surrendered unto the Lord. Now, the door of service, there is much work for you and I to do 
in regards to this. But I want to ask you a question individually this morning. What door has God placed before you to minister to others? What, God, what door has God opened for you? Now listen, God is looking for surrendered life for Christian service. Jesus says this, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. See, this is an open door that God has placed before each of us today. It's open. It's there. Follow me, he says, and I will make you fishers of men. Christian, for whatever reason, I want to say this to you. Don't stand outside the door of Christian service, regardless of who's opposed you, who's annoyed you, or what has happened to you. Discern to see for yourself that there will be many things come against us to oppose us. And don't stand outside that door of service. If God gives you an opportunity to minister to someone, whether it be in a car park, whether it be in the shop entrance, take it. Take it. And He will use you to catch the lost souls of men. So there's a door of surrender, there's a door of service, and then there's a door of sacrifice. Living for the Lord involves personal sacrifice. I, I think we all know this. But we have to be reminded about it. It's just how it is. Christ himself went to the cross as a personal sacrifice for the redemption of men. The Christian walk and personal sacrifice just seem to be one and the same. For many, the door of sacrifice has often been avoided. And sadly, because of this choice, many blessings have been missed. Listen, you all know that there's been times in your life where God has given you an opportunity to do something for him, to speak to somebody, to minister for somebody, perhaps to pray for somebody, and perhaps fear got in and we've walked on, and every one of us has found ourselves in that position. But God opens the doors for us regularly. And I believe, I'm not sure I can back it up, but I believe where, where I have missed other faithful brethren have stood in. I refuse to accept it because I feel the Lord wants that somebody else was lost because of that. I believe God's faithful in, in, in rising up men and women of God, but let us not take the chance. Walk through them doors of opportunities as they come. Now, God himself displayed this act of personal sacrifice. We're told that he gave his only son to die in our place. Many of us don't understand the depth of what that means. I'm not sure I do, but I know it involves a great loss, a great pain, a great sacrifice. And there's perhaps no greater example to a parent to read that and sit and meditate on that of the personal cost of ministry. One commentator said this, living for God regard, re requires giving. It involves forgetting about ourselves and doing whatever needs done to see that soul saved. And Jesus often spoke of the personal cost of following him in this world. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What does this look like in practice, though? Well, we see it in the life of Paul in Galatians 2. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. Then there's some key words comes along. And here, here they are. It's no longer I who live, uh, but Christ who lives in me. And the, now, the life that I now live, I live by faith. And what we learn is a sacrificed life is a life lived for God and it's a life of faith. But we also learn in closer detail, it's a battle of wills. The cry of the believer is this, oh Lord, today it's no longer I, God. Lord, let it no longer be I, Lord. Oh, I, I don't want to go on, you see. I want to stop. I want to just go back to the easy life. Lord, it's no longer I who live. Paul had to crucify his desires daily. Do you understand? It wasn't easy. He didn't just get up in the morning and go, oh, I just live for Jesus today. I've no aspirations to desires of my own. I'll just he died. And that, that's what we get an example of. And that's probably the extreme version, but that's what it is for that man. What is it for us? It's to live for Christ, to live for God. And when he speaks, we act. And when our life is in alignment with the word of God, we get it into the place where it glorifies him where it's no longer I, but Christ, and it's a battle of wills. So today there's been three doors set before us. The door of surrender, the door of service, and the door of personal sacrifice. Now, I just want to take a few moments now and, and speak about once we enter through these doors of 
of, of surrender and service and sacrifice in the faith, we are ready for service. And God will bring us through these doors. It's His work. And we'll be primed, and He primes us. And these are doors of opportunities that God has placed before us. There's many, there's thousands. I'm just going to mention one or two, just, to, just an example, I'll give you an example this morning. And I'm speaking broadly to the church. So every believer has been given opportunities. Let it not be said that God has not given you an opportunity. First opportunity I want to bring out is to evangelize. Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every person. A life lived for God often speaks about God. It's just how it is. He touches us in such a way we can't help but talk about it. The Bible teaches that there are two ways for the church to evangelize, by our living and by our conversion, conversation. So there's the opportunity to evangelize. The next one is the opportunity to disciple people. And I love it, and it's happening within this church already. Thank God it's happening within this church. Matthew 28, 19 says, Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, just as we pass by there, if you would like to be baptized, you're saved and you're not baptized, speak to me after and we, we will probably plan to do a baptism service uh, just after the summer. If you'd like to be baptized, sure, let us know. Let me know personally. Give me your name and we look to that. So, so each believer is a disciple maker. We don't just win people for the Lord. We also have to train them. It's not the thing. We have an idea that we want people to come through the door saved and all cleaned up and shaven and all the rest. That's not what the Bible teaches. We have to make disciples. That means when people come through these doors, their lives aren't right. That's normal. And when they come to faith, the Lord begins to work in them. Hallelujah. The Lord works in them, not us. And we guide them. We help them. And when they make a mistake, we encourage them on, you see. We don't criticize them. We don't tell them how bad their life is. We say, come on, brother. Come on, sister. Keep on going. Amen? We make disciples. We make disciples. I know men and women have come to faith and had to leave the church because the way the church treated them. All they did was highlight their faults. Don't be that, church. Don't be that. Get, the, get beside them and say, come on. God's got a better way for you. We are discipleship makers with tenderness and with patience. We teach and we train others to go on in godliness. A new Christian is a baby, a spiritual baby. And that person needs help, needs instruction. And it takes time for them to get their life in order. We must help them and encourage them. So we each have an opportunity to evangelize, to disciple. And there's an opportunity, we'll end with this one, to fill the local church. Praise the Lord. I often hear people say it's not about numbers. God doesn't want his house empty. He doesn't want glory empty. He wants you in it. He wants your loved ones in it. He wants your children worshiping him in it. And I'm going to show you through scripture. But listen, it takes a wee bit of work from us. We each have an opportunity to be part of this great calling to fill the house. Luke 14, 23. And the master said to the servant, go out into the highways, into the byways. That's the shucks, the hedges. And compel people. Compel people. Will you come? Oh, will you come? Come on, there's a man test around tonight. Will you come? Come on, God can help you. Will you come? I don't believe in God. He did this. Will you just come? Just give it a go. Will you come? Compel people. Not threaten people. Not curse them into hell. Oh, that person's going to hell. There's no chance. Never come to church. Listen, let us be disciple makers. Let us be God's house fillers, ushers into the house of God. Compel them to come in that my house may be filled, the Bible says. What an opportunity we have been given. What a responsibility has been placed to us. It's part of our calling to be inviting, to come to the meeting, that the Lord's house would be filled and that his gospel would be, would be preached and lives would be changed. Praise God. What an opportunity, church. Let us go. And as we go about serving the Lord, let us compel. Perhaps some of you forgot to do that. Maybe some of you used to always do that and you've stopped. Can I encourage you? Because the Bible says so. Compel. Invite them in. And watch what Jesus does. I, if anybody's ever been in the office and ministered with me, I always say to them, listen, if Jesus doesn't change your life, we're bait. All I can do is point you to him. That's it. We've no magic potion. The Lord Jesus changes lives. Him alone. We point people. We point people to him. I compel them to surrender their lives. But after that, it's up between them and God. 
Let us go out and compel people to come in to the house of God. Now listen, there are many doors of opportunity placed before you and I. And with, with that comes many obstacles. And there's one few verses I just want to leave with that. There's opposition. There's opposition. And some of you perhaps are no longer just being as effective in the ministry as you once were because there's been opposition. Somebody's opposed you. Somebody's annoyed you. Something's been said. You know, that's what happens. I've experienced it in my own life. More times I was going to leave the Lord's work because of a person, not because the Lord told me to do so. A great door, Paul says, has opened to me, but there are many, he says, who oppose me. Christian, opposition to living for God is a reality that we need to come to terms with. At times, there will be people around us who will seek to oppose us. We've talked about them, the terrors. They're, they're just not of God. But here's the better one for you. The most opposition that you will face will come from within. I'm going to bring this out. Past failures, unrealized expectations, bad decisions, fear of failure has all caused us to stop going on. Well, God didn't turn up that time. Well, that wasn't the outcome I wanted. Nobody showed up. Nobody was saved. Where was the help? You see, there's so many things. The enemy loves to remind us of all of these things of our past. And he seeks to pull the rug from under our feet. But here's the thing. He can't pull Christ from us. He can pull the world from us. He can do all them things, but he can't pull Christ from us. Now, many Christians have tried in the past to do something great for the Lord. And whether they faced opposition or for whatever reason they've failed, and ever, as a result, they've never tried again. And if that's you, stop it. Stop it. Keep going. Keep her lit. Keep her lit. There's a saying. Very deep theological saying. Keep her lit. I remember an old farmer in the session, our man, we're going through a difficult time in the church, and he's a, one of the biggest farmers in town. He goes, brother, he whispered to me, your brother, put on the spiritual welly boots and tramp through the, you can manage the rest. And that was the greatest advice church. Greatest advice. I've listened to that in my ear many times. And he'll put on the spirits of wally books. This is only our mess. I'll muck that's trying to hinder you from the work. So take your spirits of wally boots, child of God. Whatever's opposed you or stopped you, stick them on and tromp on through the muck and watch what Jesus will do. Because I'll tell you one thing, there was a sinner here lying in the muck needed the Lord. Perhaps you were the same. And when I walked through the muck, the Lord lifted me up. I went, oh, sorry, when the brethren walked through the muck, and they told me of my need, I was saved. Praise the Lord. We'll move on. But many people have stopped to go on because of failure. Let me just say this about the Apostle Paul, and we really need to wrap this up. Hey, you know them preachers keep saying I'm finished, and they just don't finish. Something I want to just say to you, I think it's important, or I would just wrap it up. And you know I do that. If it's just feel I need to wrap it up. I don't feel I need to have one minute, a couple of minutes. Let's not be too tight. Do you think the people in the Bible were perfected in their ministry. My greatest hero in the Bible, for some reason, the Apostle Paul. Just love the man. Just love the man. I don't think I could work with him because he'd be hard work. But I love him in the abstract, at least. And let me say this about the Apostle Paul. Every time the man got on a ship to go and preach the gospel, it nearly always sank. You see? One of these instances, after the ship sank, he went to warm himself on a fire, and a snake bit him and latched onto him, and everybody just left and thought he's going to die. He's cursed of God. But it gets better. The Apostle Paul had a great gift of literally boring people to death in his preaching. I know I'm not related to him. Acts 20, verse 9. You can read it for yourself. It says this. Paul preached on and on and on. That's... Well, there's two ons. I've added a few. Makes a good story. And we're told that a man who was sitting on the window ledge in the third floor fell asleep and he fell to his death. That would have been some meeting. And here's the thing. They prayed for him when he came back to life. But here's the point. The Apostle Paul wasn't perfect. He wasn't the greatest preacher in the world. He wasn't the greatest person to have on the boat when you're going on holidays with you. He was a disaster in many times. He got himself onto all handlings. People who went with him in ministry ended up whipped, beaten, locked up, all these things, excommunicated. He was a walking nightmare, if you like. 
Now, everybody would agree, the scriptures testify to at least that in part. Paul, like you, like me, got it wrong many times. But it didn't stop him, you see. That's the point. It didn't stop him taking these opportunities, these open doors that God set before him. And in Philippians 3, he says this, brothers and sisters, this is his words. Not that I've made it in ministry. Now, there's a good context, what I've just told you. This is what he says. Not that I've made it. I've sank a few ships. I've got a few snake bites. I've, I've racked a few prisons. You see, not that I've made it. But one thing I do, I forget what was the past. Maybe that's you this morning. You need to forget your past. And I look forward to what lies ahead, what God has for me. Not what the world did to me. Not what people speak about me over my life, but God's promised good things for me. If I would just go through them doors and trust them, will you trust them? Will you forget your past and look forward? And then he says this, I press on, he says, towards the goal. Press on. Now, after we've heard this morning, you could write, you could interpret this yourself. Paul put on the welly boots. And he pressed on the upward call of God. And then he says this, let those of us who are mature think like this. I know there's a mature congregation before me. And maturity means that we forget the past, as the Bible tells us, that we forget our failures and we keep going, we keep looking forward, pressing on that God has placed before us and we be a witness. Amen? Amen. What door has God placed before you this morning, child of God? You're not insignificant yet. You have a purpose. There is a call in all of our lives. It's not about making money, spending money, paying bills. Unfortunately, that's the way of the world. But when we get into the business, God's business, there'll be doors. So for some of you this morning, you're having a problem with your will. Your will's in the problem this morning. You're in the road. You need to go through that door of surrender. For some of you, you need to enter back in through that door of service. For others, you need to get that, remember that door of sacrifice, of personal cost. Yeah, it's going to cost you. But it'll not, the Lord is no man's debtor. What about them doors of opportunity before you? Maybe you haven't been ministering or serving God for a while in your life. Why don't you start with this opportunity to evangelize? Look for the person beside you who's not long saved. Start speaking into their life. What about the young mother who never, never had a mother? She doesn't have a mother or children. Some of you have reared grandchildren. What about the father who's never had a father and he's trying to father his kids? Speak into their lives, you see. Make disciples. Then an opportunity to invite people into the Lord's house his house may be filled.